I, I, there's YouTube channels out there occasionally that show up in my feed and these guys, I watch a few minutes of their stuff and they, you know, your adjuster is trying to not pay, da 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 It's just not true. It's not true. It isn't true. We want to pay everything we can. Yeah. Remember earlier in the conversation we were saying we get paid more the more the bigger yep. the claim is? That's true. So those two things are not compatible. They don't. This is Adjuster TV. Adjuster TV is brought to you by Paysetter Claim Service. Learn more at adjustertv.com slash paysetter. e provider Kaplik. Download the free insurance for adjusters guide at cplic.net slash adjuster TV. And by Crawford Catastrophe Services. Join Adjuster TV at the 2022 Crawford & Company CAT Conference the first week of March 2022 in Orlando. There are literally dozens of training classes, including wildfire, flood, and several carrier certifications, among others. Register for the conference right now for early bird pricing. Get full details at crawco.com slash cat and scroll down to the conference link. The full link is in the description where you're watching or listening to this program. Again, Adjuster TV will be attending this conference, so when you sign up, let them know we sent you. Hey, what's up, Matt? And James here Hello. with Adjuster TV. And for the best tips and tools for getting on the first call list as an independent adjuster, subscribe. Believe it or not, subscribing to YouTube channels helps those channels because it tells the algorithm that you like this content. Hit the bell notification, it tells them that you like it even more. Hit the thumbs up, the, the like or the dislike. They've taken away the dislikes, so you can't see how many dislikes there are. So you can dislike all you want to, I'm not gonna see, then they'll never show me. But hit the like button. Um, so James Mathis and I are going to uh, talk a little bit about money and claim file accuracy and some other stuff, and then we're going to tell some stories and you know just good times here uh, on the old Adjuster TV in outfit the, in the beautiful studios of in Adjuster the, yeah. TV yeah, in it's very beautiful clean. downtown Kalispell. Montana. Yep. It's a beautiful place. Yeah. Snowy. Snowy. You're a, you know, <clears throat> as I keep reminding everybody, I'm not built for this stuff, but uh, it, it sure is pretty up here. So. so, you know, question we get all the time. <laughs> and it's, it, I, it's, it's the question I had in the beginning. I mean, it's like, how much can you make doing this job? A couple of bucks. Why would anybody want to do this work? Beer bullet and if, make money. Yeah. yeah. Why would anybody <laughs> want to do this job if it, this, this kind of work if it didn't if it wasn't worth it? Um, I want to talk a little bit about that because I think it's uh, people, some people get into this business for the wrong reason. They get into it for only that reason, and I think that it's uh, if somebody shows up and they are like, I heard that I could make a hundred thousand dollar or one hundred sixty thousand dollars or depending on who you ask, $300,000 in a year doing hurricanes, right? Which is what, when I first started, that's what everybody was like, man, we're going to go do hurricanes every summer and, you know, we're going to make all this money, blah, blah, blah. Well, hurricanes don't happen every summer. Um, People think that they just show up and they're just going to start, money's just going to start falling out of the sky on top of them, right? All they got to do is pick it up off the ground and stuff it in their pockets. But we know the reality, Right, James. What's the reality? You don't pick it up off the ground. It, there's little bags laying around that you pick up. Oh. It's already prepackaged for you. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, right. No. It's 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 work, man. And it it's it's hard to get started. It's hard to get started. It's uh, it's it takes a while before you're really good enough to really see the, you know, not. Let's back up a second. Depending on where you're going and what you're doing and who you're working for, you can make some decent money out of the shoot if you're on one of these deployments that pays you hourly. And I mean, we've talked about that in a previous podcast. You give me a, you know, if I'm just starting off and and I'm not sure that, you know, of my abilities, I'm going to take that hourly in a heartbeat. I did that on my first hurricane deployment. And I'm glad I did it, you know, because if I was having to survive off of what I was closing those first few weeks i'd have starved you know it it would have been a bad deal um so so yeah you can make some money doing that but versus what you could make once your skills are put together 
and and cannot actually get out there writing close claims on a daily basis, um, it's difficult, you know. And and along with when you when you go in and you work in an hourly, they own you. They own your time. Oh yeah, big time. You know, um, a matter of fact, I, I I will never forget whenever I was going to stay in my RV one day and just write claims and and do work for my RV, and I get a phone call. Where are you? Why aren't you up here at the help center? You know, I'm like, well, I don't don't remember part of the contract says I had to be there. You know, I go until all the claims are closed. You need to be here every day. Yeah, and I can't argue with that because they're now. If I was getting paid commission. Oh, yeah, I can be wherever I want to ride them, yep. but they're paying me hourly, so I've got to be where they tell me to. So, the, you know, there's the give and take on that. It's decent money, but it's not near what you could make. And also, the other thing is, is that you don't make money. The, the thing that drives me crazy, and we see it all the time. And I was probably that guy too. I don't remember if I was or not, but I probably did it. Hey, I got my license. Where do I get work at? Right. You know, that's that. The, the whole thing is well. Number one is the, that is your first step getting your license. Yeah. Okay, um, if you, you got a. If you can't get a license, and there's people that can't pass that test, um, yeah, you just yeah. don't don't go any further. If you can pass the test, then you can pretty much pass the rest of it. Um, but the second thing I hear is, do I have to get on a roof? You know, <laughs> yeah. Do I have to get on a roof? Well, there's two parts of that answer, but the main answer is is yes, you're going to have yes. to get on a roof. Okay. Do you have to get on every roof? No, you don't have to get on every roof, but you have to be able to climb a roof. You have to be able to get up there. If you can't do those things, forget it. The last thing is when and how are you going to get to work when you first start? Okay. Well, right off the bat, you're not going to get dailies right off the bat because you don't have any experience. Yeah. Okay. I'm doing dailies now and, and, um, you know, it took me a couple of years before I could start doing dailies. As a matter of fact, they, kind of fast tracked me a little bit because they were so desperate for the help, but I had already proved competency and knowing what I was doing. And, um, but if, if, you know, you're going to have to wait for a, an event to happen or find a company that's going to take a chance on you. And, and how do you get that chance? Be a pest. You know, you might say, just give me one daily. They might give it to you. You might totally screw it up. You know, yeah. but at least you tried, but it's not easy to get started. And then they give you that one, you know, you don't know if you're going to get another one. I mean, I'm, I'm at the point now where I get regular work, but there are weeks where if I had to depend on that week, you know, if I, if I, if I didn't take care of my money that, and I, if I was living week to week, paycheck to paycheck, there, there's one, two, sometimes three weeks in a row where there's not any volume, yeah. <laughs> you know, and it was, it's really, really slow. I mean, I've had weeks where I've had three claims for the entire week. Um, when there was a time in my life, I could live off those three claims, you know, um, three mini claims were like minimum billers, but that's tough, you know, and even for somebody that has experience and somebody that's getting regular work and it's part of the, the rotation of, of, uh, dispatch rotation, you know, it's, you still have those peaks and valleys, Yeah, you for know, sure. and you've got to manage that money once you get, once you do get your chance. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, that's, uh, you know, you, you absolutely covered a lot of ground there and, and, um, you know, that's, I, I think once people start to get to where you're at, they start to sort of see that, get, get a feel for the lay of the land. And that's what it is. I mean, it, it's, it can be feast or famine, especially if you only do cat. Um, but you know, as far as, Having realistic expectations, you know, the first couple of years, um, the ramping up into it is costly and time consuming. Um, if it's, if somebody tries to tell you that it's not, if there's a free way to do it, you know, they may not be get, shooting you totally straight. Um, because one of the things I see is that people want to get stuff so they can put on their resume, mm -hmm. um, thinking that that's what the firms want to see. The firms honestly don't care. Just straight up, they'll. It doesn't matter if you only had McDonald's on your resume; they're going to put you on the roster somewhere, right? And if, but if you if you're getting training, if you show up to their free training or their like super low cost carrier certification trainings, and you do all right, then you might probably can get, go to work. But if you, if it doesn't click with you, you're not going to go to work. No matter what other training you ha you've ha you've got, um, your your true first like test. Your first real 
like the actual first job interview, so to speak, is your first, the claims that they first assign you, right? Your yep. first storm deployment in particular. And which is for most people, vast majority of people, it's some kind of a storm deployment of some kind a hurricane or you know texas deep freeze or whatever something that's huge right snowmageddon snowmageddon um snowpocalypse so but i see like i said i see people like they think that they got to put stuff on their resume so they'll go get these free things or they'll they'll do a ride along with somebody and call that training and it's just there's this is not hard work but there's a lot of moving parts want to work from home Thought that might get your attention. I'll cut to the chase here and tell you that the IA firm Paysetter Claim Service frequently has work from home opportunities for the field and also for desk work, which let's be honest, really just means work at home in your PJs. Still wanna work in the field though? Paysetter's Evo platform is fully integrated with Hover. It is the best of the app-based claims handling systems out there right now. Technology is moving faster than ever and Paysetter is right there at the cutting edge. We put together a free guide to maximizing your productivity while working at home in your pajamas, along with a link to apply to this dynamic firm. And you can find both at adjustertv.com slash paysetter. Right, and the hard part about the work really is managing all the moving parts, right? Time management, efficiency, and all that kind of stuff. Um, as well as individually understanding how to use the software, having a fundamental knowledge of construction, you know, customer service, having some policy knowledge, being able to understand, like, if you're looking at something, to know that you need to check the policy to see if that's covered or how much you could pay on it, and then knowing where in the policy and how to look in the policy to find that stuff, and then how to explain it to the homeowner, whichever way it goes, right? So there's a lot of that kind of stuff. If, if a person spends a little bit more money and pays for high quality training, not a nine day, you know, a caddy, right, down right. in Fort Worth. Um, or, you know, if they've got deep pockets um, or they've got a GI Bill or some sort of veteran, you know, benefit, right. go to Veteran Justice. Mr. Guy Grant. Mr. Guy Grant, right. And that's a six week program. It's expensive, but you're, he puts you up in a house. You, you, you don't have to pay for housing while you're there because you stay in one of those houses that you're inspecting. Uh, but it's immersive. It teaches you how, how to not only do the individual pieces of the claims process, but how to be an adjuster, how to manage phone calls, how to manage. He has like these people that act like insureds, and they'll one person will be so, totally normal and nice, and the next person's you Jerk. Know, a jackass, and yeah. so on and so forth. Um, but that kind of thing really prepares a person. If they're able to go on a cat with somebody and do a ride along and see that stuff firsthand for a few days or a week and maybe carry the person's ladder around, I mean, that's that's not worth nothing. But having your hands on it and doing the claims process from start to finish is the thing, right? Um, so getting started, people, ha they have to understand that they can't just like, they can't just show up and expect to get paid. They can't, you know, get a level one or two Xactimate certification and say, well, I'm, you know, that's all I need to know and, and you know, f put me to work. Those people wash out. Level three master, you know, Xactimate people wash out of hurricanes. I hear it all the time um, because they, they don't know the rest of it. They don't know how to put use exact in the context of a claim, which is what these training schools are gonna teach you, right? Um, so they need to spend some money up front on training, getting licenses, um, starting to do some stuff on the side, right? Don't quit your day job, yep. right? Um, I think these days, this photo and scope stuff works really well for people who wanna dip a toe in, because I think you can schedule a lot of that yourself, yep. um, or just say, I only can do it after five o'clock and on weekends or whatever, and then you just, it's on in the app, right? And you just accept decline jobs. Um, and it's walking around with the picture, your, your phone up, taking pictures, and it, some of the software even will tell you which picture to take next yep. and what it should look like, right? Especially for the audio. They frame one. it for you. Yeah, and they frame it up for you and everything. Um, do that kind of thing. That pays, it's not, you're not gonna get rich doing it. It's not money falling out of the sky, but it gets you started. It gets a person, you know, to figuring out how to take the right kind of photos, which is a big deal, and how to move around properties. And you may have to talk to a, a homeowner, a, a contractor might be there um, that you might have to talk to, or not. Most, I don't know. Depends on the program, I guess. Um, and 
uh, just know that none of this stuff, with the exception of doing the photo scope stuff, none of this stuff is free, right? Licenses right. are not free. Um, and in some cases, they're not even really that cheap. And if you get a bunch of them, it's expensive. Um, having gear. Um, gear is expensive. Yeah. Ladders. You know, and we can talk about ladders. I think we should add that to this. Um, having a camera. Um, you know, these for some reason, I'm having trouble finding, like on Amazon, like a good camera, like a good snapshot camera. Like, yeah, I just... Number one is if you find one that's decent with all the specs you want, yeah, it's back ordered. You can't get them right now. Yeah, I tried to find one recently. I can't get one. So I'm not seeing hardly anything on Amazon. I have two cell phones. Yeah, one for taking pictures and one for well, well no, one in case I break the other one. I've got uh, I can switch this. I can switch out the SIM card and use the camera. So <laughs> you got to have a good laptop. You got to, and it's this is. I mean, we're we're into we're four digits here easily yeah. mid could be pushing into like high four digits of just getting ready. I spent I all together everything I've spent by the time I got all my tools, the training I was trying to get, everything else, I spent ten grand. Yeah. You know. And that's before you walk out the door to take right. the deployment. Correct. You know. So and that includes traveling, you know a lot of the, the firms lodging. Lodging. You know, you have to pay that out of your pocket. Yeah. All you that know, stuff. Up front when so, you get paid. The thing about it is, is that the expenses can be, to, to getting started, they can be kind of high, right? Not, nothing compared to like other careers. Like, I mean, you're not gonna, you don't have to go and get a four year degree or even a two year degree to do this job where you're gonna make, you have the potential to make a lot more than somebody with a bachelor's degree or even a master's degree for that matter, or an associates, right? You're not gonna spend $120,000 getting a bachelor's degree, which I think is what it costs now. Um, you, once you get all, all your prep and everything and you've gotten on a couple of IA firms and then you get a call, then, you know, you show up on site and the stories that I hear when I talk to firms, I mean, they're like, you know, we have people showing up and they think that, uh, they, like they rode down together in one car, right? Like a little Honda Civic or something like that. And they think they're going to run claims together. Well, you know, we're just, we'll just ride around together and I'll look at one of his and I'll look at one of mine and I'll look at one of his and look at one of mine. Do we need to, do we need a ladder? You know, we're supposed to get on roofs, you know, that kind of stuff. And they, and they have no clue, right? Part of the reason why we have this channel is to help people get a clue about this. That was like the story whenever I was in Louisiana, three people showed up in the same car what and the uh, they were freaking out because well, all of our claims are spread out all over the place. Well, f well, first they didn't say anything to anybody. Then they figure out these people are way behind. Then they find out what's going on with it. And I think the next day they all left. Yeah. Yeah. yeah they either was, got let go or they. They were like, I got to figure out, you grab another car somewhere. Y'all can't, yeah. can't do this. You know, depending on when you show up for in the, the pay period, the pay cycle, mm -hmm. right? Sometimes some companies will like make it once a week. Like Pilot did that a few times on a big, big cat. They'd say, we're going to pay everybody once a week. Or they, they, but they would do it every two weeks and you had to have your. You know, your, all your, your invoices in by the, the Monday of right. the whatever. Um, so when you show up on site and you're brand new, you never run a claim before. And it's not gonna, you're not going to have closed claims the first day unless you listen to what I tell you to do, which is to close claims starting the first day. But most 99% of people don't do that. I didn't listen to you. They go out, all right, exactly. So. They go out and they scope. Monday, they scope Tuesday, they scope all the way through, you know, maybe the middle of the, ne the next week. And then they go, all right, well, I'm going to sit down and write these up, right? Well, where are you in the pay period? You know, you got to be thinking about that because you're not getting paid for those all those days of just scoping. You don't get paid by I, an hour, right? And I'm joking. I did close claims first day. Well, good. Over the phone. Yeah. Like yeah. express claims. Yeah. Also, a, I'll say withdrawal is a closed claim. It is. It's a, it's a, if that's a closed claim. That's right. Yep. And, they're, so, and they're looking for production, man. Hey, he's a closer. That's right. Exactly. He may not be in sales anymore, but he's a closer. <laughs> um, so you know you got to have money set aside for that right so your hotel your, your um, food that you're going to eat out your fuel I mean you might be driving you know and right now I mean if, if 20, we got 100 miles yeah I mean if you got a big Who huge that? you know event right now gas prices are through the roof right um, so 
a lot of expenses. You got to have you got to have some skin in the game. You got to be prepared for this. You can't just have a few like fluffy things that look nice on a resume. You have to do those things for yourself because once you start closing claims, that's when the, the IA firms are going to take notice of you and they're going to say, "Oh, this person's producing. Let's take a look and see how they're doing on their technical accuracy." Yada yada yada. Um, looks good. Let's start throwing resources at this person. Let's help them help us because they want closed claims and more important than anything, you know? And so you get your first event under your belt. You're not done, right? You don't just sit back, go home, go to the beach, whatever you, you have to get more claims. So by the, so in, in the course of a year, you know, an adjuster who makes good money, like how many claims did you close this in 2021? God, man, I think I, you think ballpark. Probably more than three hundred. Oh, I'm well over three. Five to six hundred. I am. I am. I. The last time I looked, I was over four, mm-hmm. and I don't remember exactly what the number was, but and that didn't even include auto claims. You know, facing a lawsuit can be a terrifying and stressful experience, jeopardizing your years of hard work and success. If you don't have adequate insurance coverage as an adjuster, you're putting yourself at great financial risk. If you make your living from handling claims as an independent adjuster, then you must get errors and emissions and general liability insurance coverage. It doesn't matter if you're a 1099 or a W-2 or you work Carrier Direct, protect yourself with professional liability insurance from Kaplik. To find out more and to download the insurance for adjusters free guide, head on over to cplic.net slash adjuster TV. That's cplic.net slash adjuster TV. Yeah. That I did. That's so, just what I did through exact wear and stability. Yep. So any year where I made six figures, which after my first couple of years was most of them, I was doing 600 plus mm-hmm. like close claims a year. And any adjuster that has been doing this and that makes good money doing it, unless they're doing flood and they're really super busy with flood or they do large loss commercial or it's other things where it's, you know, the claims might take you several days to do one, but you get paid a lot of money on it. You're doing high volume, right? So, in order to my the whole point of what I'm talking about this is is in order to make the kind of money that you hear about, you got to work your rear end off, and it's it's sixteen hour days, seven days a week for as long as you can stand it, right? Until you get to where you want to be, um, and then you've got to like hustle and and do stuff that you don't feel like you need you should be made to do, like take the the flyer claims that are you know way out there, hundred fifty miles nowhere. away. Well, yeah, and take those with a smile because you're building a relationship with the, the people at these firms. And, you know, I know, James, you can attest to this. You you reap the benefits of that kind of reciprocity when you when you say, you know what, I'm going to help you. The, the three guys that you call before you called me turned it down or they, get, they, they made a big deal about mileage or something or other. And they didn't want to they didn't want to do it. And so you're the first person that said yes with a smile. I want to work with that kind of person. So I want to try and keep you busy because I know if I don't, you're going to go over for somebody else. Right. Cause you gotta, you gotta work because you gotta, you gotta get those four, five, six hundred thousand claims in a year. So <clears throat> the other thing is, is that let's go back to the thing and I preach over and over and over. The more that I say yes, the more opportunities I get to yeah. say yes. If I say no, I get less opportunities to say yes. And they want, people that are willing to work and do that and they pay you back man they it i'm i'm experiencing it now uh, i get a gift every now and then you know i i got a claim thrown at me that was totally screwed up okay they could have handled this at the desk you know instead they threw it out to me everything i needed was right there i rewrote the thing it went a five thousand dollar claim was the original estimate. When I finished it, I'm just under fifty thousand, and I got the difference in the fee bill. Yeah, you know, yeah. and it took me thirty minutes to do it. But why did they send it to me? Because I'd help. They just told me, "Hey, we're going to give you this because you did this," you yeah. know, right. or "Hey, you went on this wild goose chase on this one," you know. Yep. <laughs> take care of this for us and that's actually what happened one i had one that was just stupid and they go hey we found this one for you why don't you take care of it for us and i did that and then also you know i've been running in some areas this year that they have a hard 
time covering and now I'm going to get to go home and work in an area that's in my backyard and yep. and get to do the things that I that I came into this business for and and it's starting to pay off and that's because I was willing to go out and do the things that other people didn't want to do or they have a difficult time finding people to do it yeah you know big time um you know it's taking risk and some people don't have an appetite for risk you know but I mean I took, took a chance and and there have been trips that I've taken that they were not financially rewarding. I had one last year and I had one this year that, you know, it was not a wise decision to go there, but you didn't know before you went. But once you got there, you were kind of stuck there. And like my last one I just went on, man, it was not, it was not the greatest as far as the work, the drive, the, the financial reward on it. Yeah. I didn't lose money. I, I'm going to make money off of it, but it wasn't what I would normally expect uh, considering what I was doing, but I did it. And the company that I did it for is like, man, we appreciate it. Yeah. And they're, and they're taking care of me on it. So yeah. The number of times I've had, I've, I've, I, I always said yes to everything. Always. The number of times that I had something come back my way, not even like necessarily like them saying, Hey, you did this for us. I'm giving you this. It was just like, and well, in one case, it did. I got a letter from the owner of the IA firm I was working for. It had this really, it was a terrible deployment. There was no damage, but all these contractors, what happened was <coughs> they had like pea sized hail in this little town. Mm -hmm. And a staff adjuster from the carrier went out and totaled like a dozen roofs, which you shouldn't have. Right. And so the contractors, like, there's like three different roofers. It was a little tiny town, like maybe, maybe five or 6,000 people in it. But there was, a, a, you know, like two or three contractors that were running around who were telling everybody that they got hail damage. And the first thing that they would say, well, you know, so-and-so bought that one over there and they bought that one over there. And they probably did. And I, had, I denied every single roof. I, because it wasn't damage. I'm not going to pay for it just because somebody else did and the guy wants it. Mm -hmm. Right getting yelled at all day long every single day by the homeowners and by these contractors and you know I, I was I was on a first name basis with these guys and you know it became kind of like I mean you try to be cool and a little friendly or whatever so you kind of had like this here we go again you know let's just get through this you know I know you're gonna say no kind of a deal and laugh and I'm like well you know I mean if, if it's here it's, I'll pay for it but if it's not here I can't pay for it so it was a terrible deployment right so I was there for like six weeks I got a letter from the owner of the IA firm with a check, a handwritten letter saying, Hey, listen, you know, thank you so much for, for doing this. You know, we know this is a really rough one and, and you really helped us out with it. Here's something to kind of help kind of bridge the gap. Send me a check, right? Undisclosed four figure number on there. Um, so, but the things that you don't hear that, that you don't see or that they don't you know, specifically say, Hey, because you did a, we're giving you B is when, you know, if things are a little bit slow and they say, you get a call from them and they say, Hey Matt, uh, we've got 77 commercial buildings on, under one policy. Uh, <coughs> it's, you know, two States away. That's the only thing we got over there. It's hail. It should be a home run. You want them? Heck yeah, I do buzz over there for three days, knock out 77 commercial claims and go home and get a, you know, <coughs> get a five digit digit payday on that. Right. Um, so that's the kind of thing that, that, that like you're saying that they'll do is they'll, cause they want to, they want to keep Excuse me. good people and they want to keep them busy. They don't want them running off to some other IA firm where, you know, the grass might be greener over there or whatever. So they will, once you demonstrate that you're somebody who is wants to, to help them out and not just help yourself, right? You know, being a mercenary. That's that those are the kinds of people that they want them. They want to have working for them and that's the kind of people that they want to have, you know, representing them to the carrier because your work product is what the carrier sees, right? Um so say yes to everything and understand that the six figures don't you don't just get them just for showing up, just for going on one hurricane once every two or three years. You get it by busting your butt day in and day out you know, closing a lot of claims. The kind of people that they want to have on their rosters are the kind of people who are going to say yes to everything with a smile, who are going to uh, produce, you know, that is close a lot of claims because it helps everybody, right? It helps the insured because the claim, their claim gets closed faster and they get money in their hand faster. It helps everybody else, helps yourself because, you know, like we're saying, 
you got to be north of four or five hundred claims a year in order for this to even be worth doing, right? In order for you to be able to cover your expenses um, while you're on the road and to, you know, have it be something that's better than sitting in the office or flipping burgers or turning a wrench or whatever, right? So when we talk about like people's first opportunities, generally it's going to be a big hurricane. And, you know, not only do you have to deal with, you know, doing the wrong thing first, which is scoping and scoping and scoping and scoping, and maybe running out of money before you get paid, but a lot of times there's limited resources, you know, on the IA firm or in the carrier side to help you if you don't know what you're doing, right? So that brings up something else we talk about, the limited resources, and it was something that I experienced, something I hear about all the time. Um, anybody that's ever been on a big event and and you're you actually are good at this job you've probably experienced it too and that is just getting frustrated with the whole process especially on a big claim a, a big you know event like a hurricane you know my my experience was is that i'm out there i'm closing claims from day one i'm out there trying to you know do a good job i'm i'm you know worried about my cycle times from the time that i was re- you know I, I know that as far as from the time that i re- received it to the time I called the person, I got that covered. But because of the vast number of claims I had, I wasn't going to make it from the time that, you know, I made contact to the, to the inspection. But what I wanted to make sure of is from the time that I inspected it to close, I wanted that to happen, you know, because I can control those things. Well, again, this was my first deployment and, and I'm needing help. You know, I'm, I'm, I've got some things, that, you know, I've never seen before. Um, not that great at Xactimate yet. Um, I'm pretty good at it, but there's still some things that, and there's also carrier guidelines that are a little bit, con, you know, they're they're not 100%. You know, you got to kind of weed through it. And then you're trying to get help, and you can't get help, you know. And you're sitting there watching, you know, these managers in a help room working with people that you're like going here's how you turn your laptop on right first you take it out of the box with cut the tape off of it yep. and open well you know like the one guy you know my very first day on the on hurricane deployment i just got my first iphone three weeks ago and they expect me to learn this stuff in three days i mean it's like <laughs> <laughs> it is like yeah you, you know showed up th- knowing those are that. or you know they they had guys there that i mean literally cannot climb the, the guy is so old he cannot climb a ladder yeah you know and uh and he never did he didn't last long but uh but you and there you're seeing them spend time with these people you know and you've got you know something that's you know is simple it's not that it's not going to be that difficult once they just show it to you so you can close the claim and you show up at a help room. This literally happened to me where I show up at a help room at 8 a.m. I stayed there until 7 o'clock at night and could not get the help I needed, you know. And I'm I'm about done, you know. I mean, I, I'm i calling you on the phone. You know, you're talking. I'm like, I'm turning my crap in. I'm I'm dropping the stuff. I'm, I'm, I'm finished with this. You're like, oh, don't do that, James. <laughs> you want your career oh, to be over oh, with. Oh, this oh. is, you know. Pump the brakes. Yeah. Did you know that there is an adjuster school out there that has a full catastrophe property claims deployment simulation that you can sign up for for training? Let's talk about this. Veteran Adjusting School in Sedona, Arizona is just such a school. As a licensed vocational school, Veteran Adjusting School trains you to become a complete insurance adjuster. When you graduate from the Voss trained insurance adjuster program, you are ready to begin your exciting new career, whether as a daily adjuster or as a cat adjuster. Listen, there are many outstanding adjuster schools out there and you've got to get trained somewhere. Voss stands out among its peers for the depth and breadth of its program, which is a six week catastrophe deployment simulation complete with claims assignments, insured interactions, real damage that you can scope, as well as its continuing support and mentorship long after graduates become working adjusters, all of which provide a significant advantage to you. I mean, there's truly nothing else like it. Go to adjustertv.com slash VAS now and chat with an enrollment specialist who will answer all of your questions and help you decide if VAS is the right choice for you. Again, go to adjustertv.com slash VAS. Step away from the ledge, James. (laughs) And, and, um, and then I, I show up the next day. I went out and I scope a couple. I go back. 
And that afternoon, I, I probably did something I shouldn't have done, you know, but I pretty much told him I was done. And I said, I'm out of here. I, I, this is ridiculous. I'm sitting on several claims that I can't close. And I just need some simple guidance on what to do here. And um, they're like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Hey, Nate, don't, <laughs> don't leave, James. Don't, don't go. You know, you're good at this and you've got a lot of talent and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, they're, they're, they're you know, trying to make me feel good. And, and they admitted right there on the spot that they have limited resources, you know, and unfortunately they have to spend a lot of time with the the low skilled people and the people with skills get left behind. Yeah. Okay. And and people that are probably have a great opportunity in this industry that would probably be very good at this industry, there's a lot of them that leave because of that experience that I had. You know, and they were sitting there saying, they said they've seen it over and over and over. They said, we will get you taken care of. And they finally just had somebody break away, you know, stop what they were doing, sit down with me. And it literally took 20 minutes with me. Yep. And then I closed like eight claims, you know, within yeah. a couple hours. And then you're off to the races. And then I'm gone and then they don't have to deal with me again. You know, yeah. and there's a few things here and there I need some help with. But then that was my frustration. But I was ready to walk. And I had, and this was like week two you know, right. into this thing. And, and I had been closing some claims, but again, these were some things I just hadn't dealt with before. And, um, and, and that, I, I don't know if you ever experienced that when you first got started. Um, for me, that was just the worst experience. And there, there's other people I talked to that, you know, they, they were having the same problems. And then there's, you know, you'll see, you know, some people that have come in and they, they have a very high opinion of themselves and they're demanding that somebody helps them. And um, I will never forget this one person said, said, either they're going to give me some help or they're going to lose an adjuster and a really good one at that. <laughs> and of course, me being me, I quipped off. If you were that great, you wouldn't be sitting around a helper waiting for help, looking yeah, for help. Right? You know, and, and so the fight started from there, you know. <laughs> Me and that person, me and that person did not end up as besties at the end of that storm. Yeah, but uh, no surprise. But uh, um, that that was my biggest frustration I had on my first deployment. You know, I was just yeah, I, I needed the help, and they just don't have the resources to do it. You know, it's pretty common, I think, um, for a lot of big firms, especially. I don't know, even if they they do have the resources. Um, and, and you have to remember that the res finger quote resources are people who are not going to take wind claims or flood claims, and they're going to work on a day rate to go mm -hmm. sit in a conference room at some little podunk hotel and help people learn, show people how to turn their computers on all day long, every day, 12 to 17, 18 hours a day. They're mm -hmm. supposed to, only supposed to be in there from seven to seven, but every help room I've ever been to has been open until midnight. Yep. Right. And it's probably not supposed to be, but it's, you have to. Um, those people are going to pay a day rate and it's not great. It's right. just a regular old day rate for whatever. Um, you know, I did, uh, a little bit of help room stuff. I did some field support, which I, I told you this earlier. I loved doing field support because I basically was a help room person out in the field. Right. And it was a, a one on one. I just would call I call I had 22 adjusters you know that they assigned to me and I call each one figure out where they were at you know some guys had 10 years of experience and all I all I needed to do with them was occasionally go right along with them or if they needed a roof bought or something like that then I could go sign off on it or tell mm -hmm. them that they're out of their mind or whatever um, but I go to these people's hotel rooms and I'd stay there till one o'clock in the morning showing them how to build their schedule you know, showing them how to do this, how to set a reserve, how to, you know, what they should put in their activity diary, when they should call everybody, when they should do this, when they should do that, you know, how to do the job. And I think I found that to be, uh, I think, a lot more helpful than just like piling a bunch of people into a little tiny room when you got two or three people in there right. who are supposed to help. Right. And there's 50 people jammed in there. How are you going to help all those people? Right. Um, so I don't know. But even then. As a field support person, I got paid the same as what a uh, help room person got paid. It's day rate, same deal. Right. Um, but if you have a situation where you've got hurricane slams into Houston and it's flooding and it just rips the place apart and you get one that slams into you know Louisiana two weeks later and then you get one that slams into Miami or South Florida or whatever, 
highly populated areas and there there are lots there's the, the number of claims exceeds the number of available adjusters by factors of 10 you know at least mm -hmm. that also means that it exceeds the resources that each one of these ia firms has and even the carriers that they have to have to help people on site so by the time you get to that florida storm there might not be anybody there i mean they're begging people like if the, the classic example is Harvey and Irma, right? Harvey hit, everybody went to Harvey, and then Irma hit, and there wasn't anybody to go to Irma. Yeah. Um, so, you know, the frustrations are that I, I think that there's there's a, a, a model, a business, like kind of, a, I guess, a business model, or way they do, the way they run cats, where they will just throw warm bodies at it. And that's frustrating for everybody, not the least of which the homeowner, because they got to have four, five, six, eight different adjusters before somebody actually, sh actually can write shows a up check. or yeah. write, even write a check. I mean, I I had claims, you know, that I inherited, you know, yeah. and every hurricane I've ever been on, they gave me a stack of claims that had been contacted. So, I, so I had to sit there, and I mean, I was I ended up at the help room. We talked about this. I my knee went out on me again, and they put me in the help room, and I'm in there taking all the quitter claims, you know, the, and the quitter, claims. the quitter claims, the people that quit or the yeah. people that got cut. And I would have to take their claims. And if they had notes to them, you know, see if I could close the claim based on their notes and the photos that they had, or if they had to be reinspected, I'd have to send them out, you know? And so some of those, I you know, already had one person. Now it's come to me. I, that person that quit might've been the second or even third person to yeah. contact them yeah. that I get it. I call them on the, at least that person got out there and scoped it, Yeah, you know? And and then I've got to sit there and try to, you know, talk to the homeowner on the phone, try to, you know, make sure what I'm seeing and what we're dealing talk with. Come back from the edge. You know, and and then try to close it. But then, you know, you get into it, you realize I don't have enough information to be able to close this claim. And so now I've got to get it sent back out to the field again. So now they're getting another one, you know. Yikes. And, uh, and those, you know, that sucked. Yeah, you know, but that's uh, what, yeah, that's the Department of Insurance complaints start coming flying, and then, and then yeah. the carriers swamped with having to do a formal response to each one of those. Yeah. I mean, it just snowballs. But they they do it. They did it in 2021 okay. on Ida, and it's it's they it's just the way they they do it. I've I think that there's a better way, um, but it involves teaching adjusters how to how to do the job, how to manage their time more than it does showing them how to set a reserve in some obscure carrier back end, which is something they can learn on site. Right. That, so whenever you, the, the, when you just look at that whole model, okay, whenever something big happens, you know, they, a lot of that is driven by each state's regulations. You have to contact them within so many days of, of the claim being filed. Yep. You know, you have to, some states, you have to close the claim within so many right. days of it being filed. And so they know, okay, they're going to end up just sending, I mean, if you got a pulse, you know, and you can take some photos and, yep. and turn, I mean, we, we could probably use you for a while, you know, and, and that, and unfortunately that happens. And then they just say, well, we just do what we can do. We just write what we can write. We get some money in the insured's hands. At least it gets started. You know, we, we, we get something going, and then we'll deal with it on the back end. Yep. That's you know, exactly what we'll, we'll, we'll deal with it back we there. Stay compliant with the state, and then just the, 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 the first, their first thing they want to do is be compliant, put money in the pockets fast they can. Yep. That's, that's their, and then everything else is secondary after that. I'm sure. I'm sure there's some claims I wrote a year ago. They're probably still dealing with, oh, <laughs> you know, that, hey, that listen, uh, the simple, I guess it was a staff adjuster. I had claims that had been open for two years yeah. and they were simple claims, but yeah. there was asbestos and there was this and that. I mean, it's state claims stay open for a while. Yep. Um, and, and, and so you, it, it's all about production, closing claims. Yeah. Just get it closed. Get it, get it moved on. That way they can move it to the next level. You know, the other thing is they know this is what they know. And if they get some money out there to look at it, that brings down a level of frustration. If they get some money to them, that brings down another level. But if it's not enough money, 
they know that that can also create some issues, but they also know that most of those claims they're not going to see again until they get a contractor. Yeah. And they also know the contractors are so busy. Yeah. Okay. And they're in an avo. It may be months before they see that claim again. You know, it's kind of like our government does with the debt. They just kick it down the road for a little bit. Yeah. You know, yeah. I'm not saying that that's their intentional business model, but that's the results of it. Sure. You know, and, and, and that's probably probably fits in there somewhere. But just get the claims closed, man. That's yeah. that's what that's what it's about on these big events. Yeah. You know, we want accuracy. OK, but accuracy isn't always possible. Right. Which I think it's a great thing to talk about. I mean, you know, we talk about closing claims and, and volume and everything. These days, there are a growing number of remote work opportunities for independent adjusters. With Scoper Writer programs popping up all over the place, you can do photo and scope in the field, or you can just sit at home in your pajajays and write the estimates on what the scoper got when they were out in the field. And it doesn't matter where you live, as long as you have the internet, you can write claims as a desk adjuster, but you can't get that sweet gig without being licensed. So if you live in Nebraska, which doesn't require an adjuster to be licensed, you still have to have a New York license to write claims somebody scoped in New York. Makes sense? Of all the credentials you need as an adjuster, there really is none more important than your adjuster license, especially your first one. You're gonna need it to do just about everything else, including some adjuster schools even require you to have one before they'll let you enroll. So you need Adjuster Pro. Adjuster Pro provides a comprehensive and easy to use way to get and maintain your adjuster licenses. Most importantly, Adjuster Pro was founded by independent adjusters and the team at Adjuster Pro is dedicated to helping you thrive as an adjuster with resources for every licensing state, including dead simple CE packages. Adjuster Pro is the gold standard for adjuster licensing. You'll find everything you need to get licensed in one place. Go to adjustertv.com slash adjusterpro right now in, in an ideal scenario and i think experienced adjusters adjusters who this is their career this is their what they do um they are going to be a more accurate adjust with t as far as their technical their estimate and everything else is going to be more accurate their coverage analysis is going to be more accurate than a newbie um but you know there's why'd you point at me when you said that newbie <laughs> i was pointing myself okay like this okay. so but, but i think and I, and I might get in trouble for using this word i think there's a little bit of room for slop mm -hmm. and i feel like wh when i was you know at the peak of my career i didn't feel i didn't think of myself as like like the the top level like most super accurate adjuster right the my objective was to pay as close to what I thought it should be as possible the first time, right? And that's why I always want to meet with contractors because I want to be sure we're both nodding our heads at that bottom line number, right? And that the, the, the homeowner would felt comfortable with us going, this is, this is, we'll pay you this, give it to him, he'll fit, do the work and you'll be done, right? If there's something else comes up, right? Or we didn't measure right, or we miss, you know, identified a piece of a material, it's more expensive or whatever, the price goes up, then they deal with it in a supplement. What we didn't do was skip damage or, or intentionally miss damage right. or write under right on purpose because we just wanted to get money in their hands, right? So right. just as a caveat, when we talk about this, right. it's not to say be sloppy, but there, there, is, there is a point of diminishing returns where even if you wrote based on what you're looking at standing out there at the house, you wrote a 100% accurate estimate. Contractor's there, he agrees with it. Um, the chances that that claim's going to reopen for something getting added to it are high, right? You're never, you're never going to get everything. So our message here is that, you know, in light of everything that we've said with regard to hurricanes, with regard to how to make good money doing this, this work, the production number is the, is the number one number, right? Mm -hmm. All other things being equal, um, which they're not, but I mean, it's, Th right. They won't close claims, right? Um, and in a lot of cases, if if you underwrite or even overwrite, you know, you're going to be in less trouble than if you're super slow, right? You know, and and generally speaking, you know, they'll just stop giving you claims, and you're not making any money anyway because you're just maybe you're 
breaking even every week because you're just too slow too because slow. You're, you're trying to spend too much time, not you specifically, but just, you know, adjusters in general, so trying to spend too much time making like the most perfectly accurate well, possible. Well, wait, you, you were talking about me. Is that what you do? Uh, sometimes. You get in trouble for that? Uh, I, so <laughs> I've got this one manager. Chad, I'm giving you a shout out. You've always said you want me to give you a shout out. Shout out to Chad. <laughs> Chad. Chad, yeah. Right. Chad Ralston. There you go. Oh. Let's give you the whole name. So if anybody knows him, um, he's also become a friend. You know, he's he, he started off as my manager on with one carrier, and then he's moved on to something else. And so we talk. You know, and if I get stuck, I know I can pick the phone up and call him. And uh, he says. I'm, I'm, I've got one I'm dealing with. I'm talking to him on the phone. And he says, James, you are overthinking this, man. He goes, you are, you are getting way too technical. The questions you ask are great questions. Those, and, they're, and they're pretty accurate. You, you're on the right trail, you know, but it's not necessary. You're overthinking the process. What can you see? Write what you can see and nothing else. And he says, I'm also waiting for you. Sometimes when you're you're going you're talking to me about these clamps, I'm waiting for you to say, okay, so and how many nails are we going to need exactly to 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 fix this wall? You know, I'm waiting for that question from you. So yeah, I'm I'm guilty of of uh, of overthinking claims and over, you know and and trying to make sure that I get that perfect claim. Um, it, and I think that anybody that wants this to be their career and I, anybody that really takes this job seriously and is and is in it for the right reasons, I think that that's your desire. Your desire is to be as perfect as you can on yeah. these claims. For, for but the sure. truth is, is that you can't. Yeah. We can't. You know, we have hidden damage. Claims are going to open up back up for hidden damage. Number one is you're human. Humans make mistakes. Yeah. You might miss something. As thorough as you think you are, the pictures you take, the notes you take, I mean... We all miss stuff on claims. We all miscount vent caps. You know, we all miscount, you know, turtle vents. You know, those things happen. You know, we, you know, we, we sit there and think about, well, if I do this and I, do I do this and, and everything else? And it's, you, oh, wait a minute, what do you see? Just right for that. That's it. The other the frustrating thing is that, you know, like with me doing dailies right now, we talk about slop and everything else. And you have guidelines. The guidelines differ from carrier to carrier. Yep. Okay. And when you're out running, when you're out running dailies and you're, you're dealing with multiple carriers, I know guys that run dailies that the only thing they'll like Monday's USAA, Tuesday's Liberty Mutual, Wednesday's Nationwide, you know, it's, right. they, they won't run multiple carriers in the same day because when they sit down, they want to be thinking those guidelines. Well, it doesn't always work out that way. I, I haven't been able to accomplish that yet. I've tried it a few times. I, I just can't do it. Um, and so you're sitting there, just got through riding six, you know, XYZ carrier, you know, and now you've got two ABC carriers to write, and you write them to the guidelines, or you, you kind of mix your guidelines up a little yeah. bit, and it happens, you know? And then the file reviewer looks at it and sends it back and goes, James, what kind of crack were you smoking <laughs> on, these, on these two? You know, and, and, it, and it comes out that way. But, you know, back to something that's been said to me, and that, that I, it, of the hundreds of claims that I've done, you know, um, I don't think I'm to a thousand yet, but I've done hundreds. You've got to get the work done, okay? You've, you've got to be as accurate as possible, and you've got to make sure that um, you're, you're hitting those cycle times, and that's how you get more work. You know, yeah. that's that's what's that drives your cycle times drive everything. If you're sitting there looking at a claim, and and you don't want to do this on every claim, but sometimes you just have to do this. Make sure you've written a claim good enough to get it past the file reviewer. If that's all you're capable of doing on that claim, if that's all your skills are on that claim, just write it good enough to get it past the file review. And um, and hey, you know what? I learn a lot from file reviewers. Oh, by yeah. the way. Big time. I mean, I learn a lot from those guys. And and don't ever get mad at a file reviewer when they kick something back to you. Be nice to those people. Yeah. Okay. They're the gateway to you. Getting they are the gateway. They got, they can hold up several claims the day before uh, payrolls do, you know, and it could be the difference between you making a decent check that next big period and not. They will help you, you know. And if, if you've shown the willingness to to try to do right and to, and to learn from your mistakes, 
they're more apt to go ahead and collaborate your claim and and make the changes yeah. for you and then send you an email telling you what they did. Go, hey, James, in the future, do this, this, and this. I did this for you. Okay. That's, and, you, and take that and learn from it, and you'll become a lot better at it, and you'll get the cooperation of everybody around you. That's at least what's happened to me. Yeah. Well, so. I think the thing people need to remember is that, you know, you're on a team. Yep. You know, there's 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 a group of people there that are there, are there to support you, and you know, if you don't know, like if you're writing your claim, and it, you know, the reason why this is dangerous territory for us to talk about is because insurance companies and, and adjusters get accused all the time of ch- leaving stuff out of estimates. intentionally shorting claims. Intentionally yeah. shorting claims, which is never the case, it's, especially for independent adjusters, because we get a commission yeah. on the claim on top of. You know, based on the size of the claim. So if I write a one thousand dollar claim, I'm going to make you know two hundred bucks or yeah. whatever. If I write a one hundred thousand dollar claim, I could make four or five grand. Right. You know, pretty easily. Um, so it's always funny when when you, you get accused of that. And you're like, listen, this is that's the opposite. Because imagine if we we were incentivized to to do that to like underwrite claims. Oh yeah. Well, you get paid more the less you write. They would, it would have been on the news the, the first day they tried to do it. And it'd right. be in front of Congress, it'd be a whole thing, right? So there, would, there would definitely be some disgruntled, you know, adjuster somewhere going, yeah, this is the secrets, man. Well, remember we, what yeah. happened on, on Hurricane Katrina? There was a couple of girls that were field adjusters who, who said that their manager told them not to write to deny claims. For some, I, I don't know the details of it, but it was all over the, it was like the New York Times and Wall Street Journal and Congress gets involved and it's like, and it was just State Farm got thrown on it. It, it was really, that's the second, the second that kind of thing would happen, that's what would happen. Right. So they pay us f- for a bigger claim. We get a percentage of the claim. You know, you look at a fee schedule and you can, if, if you're watching this and you're a PA or you're an, a homeowner and you're w- wondering about this, if you do a Google search for in- independent insurance adjuster fee schedule, you'll see you'll be able to tell. It'll say total amount of the loss over here, you know, f- zero to five thousand, and you get paid this much. Five thousand to ten thousand, you get paid this much, a higher number. F- ten thousand to twenty-five thousand, you make more. Twenty-five to a hundred plus or whatever. I mean, it's, it it goes up and up right. and up, right? So when we talk about like getting the claim in, many times it's it's more important for us to be not quite as accurate, but to get money in the insured's hand right away so that they can start doing some kind of repairs. If they don't have a contractor yet, they can they have something to give to the contractor. We know full well that contractor looks at it. If, if, he, if he wasn't there and you didn't get an agreed scope and pricing when you were on site, it's going to reopen. It's going to reopen for, for something. So whether you do a 99.9% accurate or a 94.3% accurate file, that doesn't matter. That money's going to get paid at the end of the day anyway, right? right? And nine out of 10 times, there's always going to be a supplement. Yeah, even you if know, it's, like I said. If they're going to get it fixed, yep. there's going to be a supplement. And so like, message to adjusters is, is that you, know, you, can keep, you can keep polishing a file and making it more and more perfect and more and more. And you can spend a lot of time doing that. Uh, but the, at the end of the day, you need to get it as close as you can and have a time frame for that. If you if you start if you're spending three hours to write an estimate that should have taken you 15 minutes because you're trying to make it you know absolutely perfect, you're wasting your money. You're wasting and, and you're wasting everybody else's time as well. So turn the file in, close the file. If there's something that needs to, that's wrong with it, the file reviewers are going to catch it and they're going to kick it back and say fix it, add this, add that. You know if if you're still there and the contractor says hey you know you forgot to put such and such or your measurements are off on the roof or whatever. Then you go do a reinspection or you write a supplement or whatever, and you take care of it, right? So it's going to happen. Close the claims. You're not going to get 600 closed claims in a year if you don't close the claims, right? So, and the biggest thing I've 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 seen, and you know, we can move on from after from here after this, but tree bills, tree bills, bills from electricians bills from you know a, a tv if they get a power surge or the lightning strikes a tree next to the house and the tv goes out a computer goes out and you got adjusters like i remember on one of my first storms i didn't do this even then you go into the guy's hotel room and you know we're having standing around having beers and stuff because there's some adjusters that were staying at the same place and getting ready to go out for dinner or whatever and guy's got a desk that he brought like a big like eight foot folding table and he's got stacks of stuff everywhere and like there's like a 
some sort of a system. And I was like, what you got going on here? He's like, oh, well, you know, this, these are ones that I haven't inspected yet. And these are the ones I've inspected, but I haven't written up yet. And these are ones I got to, this is pa- back at a paper mm-hmm. file jacket and everything days. And he goes, and then these are the ones that I'm waiting on tree bills for. And it was a stack. Like, I mean, there's probably 15 or 25 claims in there, right? Waiting on tree bills. I don't know what you want a tree bill. Well, t- let's t- let's walk through this, right? So you go to a homeowner's house. They have a wind claim. They've got damage to the roof. They had a they had a tree limb on there. Nine times out of ten, when you show up, the tree limb's going to be gone because somebody came by and took it off, right? Or they did it themselves. And that tree guy, and I've talked to these guys because I've <coughs> I meet them on hurricanes and on big windstorms and stuff. This guy's going to go run around for weeks with his crews from sun up to sundown, you know, and probably after dark with some spotlights and stuff, taking trees off. The first ch- the opportunity that guy's going to have to sit down and, and put together an estimate or invoice, it's going to be weeks from when he did that work. Your tree stack of tr- files waiting on tree builds is going to be sitting there for a long time, burning up your cycle time, ruining your production, making the homeowners mad. Well, where's my claim? Insurers are starting to call your manager. They're calling their agent. You know, the stinky ones are calling the Department of Insurance, right? All because you're like, well, I was just waiting on a tree bill. They said that the guy came out. He was going to give him a bill in a day or two, which has never happened. What do you do? You write your own tree bill based on what's an exactimate. Labor, you know, if, it's a, if it was like a four-foot diameter tree and it was laying across the top of the house and they needed a crane, you know, or they should have needed a crane, hmm. pay them for a crane. Pay him for a bucket truck, pay him for a loader, pay him for four guys, eight hours each, right? And then a dumpster or whatever, because you get only, it's, it's doing tree stuff on, there's right. a thing with a policy, and break that out and turn that sucker in. And chances are, you're probably going to pay him more than what the guy wanted anyway, or he's going to charge anyway, right? Yep. I don't care. I'm, just, I'm paying it, I'm going to turn it in, right? A lot of times they'll say, oh, well, the insurance company gave us this for the tree. Okay, that sounds great, thanks. You know, and then they're 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 paying, they're t- they're taken care of, right? Don't wait for tree bills. Don't wait for electricians' bills. If you and this is <laughs> the where you'll see this is is on again windstorms where or ice storms where you know in the Midwest and a lot of parts of the country they still have aerial electrical, mm-hmm. right? So power mask gets ripped off, pulls a bunch of siding off the side of the house, and it pulls off the meter base and the the mast, right? There's that's a two line item. In the estimate, and it's within a five bucks of what the guy's gonna charge him. I've written hundreds of those. Yep. But guys are sitting there, oh, I gotta wait for an electrician. The rest, they, they said it was gonna send a bill. Right, the dang thing yourself. You're an adjuster. If it's wrong, call on the electrician. Say, hey, what would you, you know, if you don't know, or you aren't sure, or you're scared to, to like just write something, and they put it in the file. Called, you know, Joe Bob's, you know, electrical service, and he said that we're, we're charging $795 for a power mass and meter base, and reconnect, whatever, right? And then pay for the siding. Pay for the paint, pay for the fascia, pay for the getting the tree off or whatever. Close the file, turn it in, right? And then you'll find yourself at the end of the year looking at five, six, maybe 700 closed claims and six figures having to run through your checking account because you're probably not going to have, depending on how well you manage your money, which could be a whole other show, you may not have very much of that left over. Especially if you bought a, a brand new F-250 lifted $88,000 pickup truck diesel. Because you, well, you've got to have it as an adjuster, right? Why, why do you look at me when you said that? You got a Subaru. That's right. <laughs> but it's lifted. I'm driving the same. Yeah, mine too. <laughs> but it's lifted. <laughs> I'm driving the same car I bought uh, at the end of a storm season in 2006. Still driving that vehicle. Hey, it still works. It's a beauty, eh? Yeah. Paid it off. I bought it brand new. Paid it off in three years. Things been coast to coast this year too. Yeah. Just about. Yep. Didn't it go to Florida? Went to North Carolina. Went to Hilton. No, sorry, South Carolina, Hilton Head. Okay. And all the way back here. I had no, and we did. We went to Olympia. So yeah, it's been coast to coast yeah. this year. So I went to, you know, I went to Florida, and before I left town, I ran over just to see the Atlantic Ocean real fast, uh-huh. and turned around, came back, and then I went to the Pacific. I went from the Florida coast, Atlantic coast. To the Washington that's coast. That's a long drive. That's a that's a long year. Um, you got anything to add to that? Yo, know, yeah. And as far as like trees go, um, I just guessed. I mean, that's what I do. I just I just guess it, man. I what just do like you think it's good. I like. Be? Well, how many hours am I going to need to get that off the house? You know, I, you, I have two guys. It's usually two guys, four yeah. hours each. 
you know, maybe eight hours. If it's a huge day, I had one that was, I mean, gigantic. I mean, I've just left Washington. I mean, you got, right. you know, big tree there, right? humongous trees up there. And, um, I had one, it's a 12 by 12. It's, it was just this little meditation shed out in the woods. Sure. Two trees fell on it that were about three foot in diameter. Two large trees are across it, yeah. man. So I'm not going. Well, that's that's, uh, f- that's 40 hours worth of labor. Totally you know? yoga shed. Yeah, it's pretty much what it was. And uh, that's 40 hours worth of labor. Two guys, 20 yeah. hours. Two guys, 20 hours. That's what I figured out. Two guys, 20 hours of labor to, to get that out of there. And then, of course, $500 limits on Yeah, they probably have to drag it, you know, you know, 60 yards out of the backyard. And, and uh, well, they, no, this one you had to, you had to, hike 50 yards from the house to a bridge that went over a creek and then it was 20 yards past that and kind of a little bend in the creek mm-hmm. and and you know they were over that well it's the little wooden bridge to get over there is not strong enough to get a loader across it right or anything like that or even i mean i'm walking across it 220 pounds i think it's like shaking up and down you know <laughs> oh my god and how much do you think a one foot by four foot? Both these are huge. Section, they can't get a loader back there. Yeah, you know, the guy, s- the guy said probably what's going to happen is they're just going to get it removed, and he's probably just going to pay the guys to split it up, you know, and age it and use it for firewood. Yeah. Probably what he's going to end up doing, you know, doesn't matter. Hold up, but you, you he's going to get paid you for owe it. Him to haul it off. So yeah. he's going to get paid for it. I just guesstimated some hours, threw it on there, and he called me up, you know, a few days later, and says, "Hey, it's going to cost this much." Was you it know, more? He, Oh, yeah. <laughs> See? Oh, yeah. And yeah. Uh, he said, just this. He goes, I understand it's just to remove it from the shed, but this is what they call just that right there is what it's going to cost to get it off the shed. I'm like, man, just get the invoice, send it in. Yeah. You know? I got all kinds of tree stories. <laughs> it, as a cat adjuster, I mean, you're going to be dealing with trees. My best tree, my best one. Okay. I actually had one that was higher than this, but this was the best one I ever had. Louisiana, big deductible. Guy had a twenty-four thousand dollar deductible. Is what his deductible was. Yikes! His tree bill twenty-seven thousand. Dang! Twenty-seven thousand. Big one. I can guarantee you what happened there. <laughs> right. The guy, Give me over my deductible. The guy. The guy just. And they're not arguing those feet. They weren't arguing any of those tree removals. Like it is what it is. And I got pictures of it across the driveway and on the house. Yeah. I guarantee you. You know, it was like three thousand dollars what he charged, probably what he pocketed. And, and just... I have got two final things to say <laughs> about trees. One, that's probably what happened yep. is they had. I had a homeowner, <laughs> and she didn't know. She wasn't real savvy, but a, the tree guy gave her two bills. He said, "Give this one to your insurance company, and this is the one you're going to pay me." One was a lot higher than the other right. one, right? And she's like, "I don't know." He just handed me these two things. <laughs> I was like, I looked at him and I was like. Oh, really? <laughs> is that right? And I called him up. He's like, "What? I, no, I mean, I not with me. I mean, that was, you know, that was my part, partner, and we just split up." And all right. So the other thing I'll say about trees is, like you said, twenty-seven thousand. I never had one that big, but I had like some nineteen, eighteen, fifteen thousand dollars ones on Katrina, in particular. Some of sometimes, if the homeowner pays, it paid it. Like they handed the the guy a check if they had they had deep pockets or whatever, and it's a seven thousand dollar or four thousand dollar tree bill, for what looks like a pretty big job. You got to pay it. Yeah. If they paid it, you got you're kind of reimbursing them. Yeah. You can have them break it out a little bit and do the, the shenanigans with the dumpster and all that stuff. But I mean, you're not going to say, oh well, I think it should only have been six hundred bucks. You're going to get punched in the mouth with the, the Department of Insurance or whatever. So. I I, and I had called and asked my manager. I was like, this guy paid, you know, like $11,000 to get this. He's like, the, my manager's like, well, you think that's what, you know, was worth it? I was like, I mean, it was a giant tree and it was laying over the house and out, out in the backyard and crushed something in the backyard. And they have like, you know, down there, they had really long driveways and mm-hmm. big front yards. And he's like, he's like, if they paid it, you pay him. He's like, put it in the estimate and then move on. So. There you go. So. I had this one yeah. back in the day. Back in the uh, day. This is one this is this was on my biggest year ever. Mm-hmm. Like my, it was I got I earned like I earned over two hundred thousand dollars this year. Um and I that, that was the year that I, I did twelve hundred I closed twelve hundred claims. 
of the year. It was. I mean, I was from by January first until December thirty first. That by year the way, was. I'm at four forty six. Oh, close for the year. For the year. Yeah. Uh, yeah. On, on the property side. Yeah. So, so, anyway, so I'm and it was in, you know in the middle of the summer. I mean, you can make a, a pretty good use of the day. I mean, there's, the days are mm-hmm. long. I mean, the sun doesn't go down until eight thirty or nine. It's, it was in Wisconsin, so it's like the yep. the evenings are longer. You can close a lot of claims in a day. Especially if you got a system and you're fast and you're not like spending a bunch of time second guessing yourself and like to, to getting lost in the details and whatever, close the claim. Just close them, close them, close them, close them. Right, volume. Um, so I'm at this. I show up at this house and the homeowner wasn't home, and I'd call them and you know, set up an appointment, or I told them I was where when I was going to be there and you know that I call them as soon as I got done with everything. I, I write it up on site. You know, I was going to give them the numbers and stuff, and. So I get to the house, I knock on the door as a courtesy knock just to be sure. Nobody's there. And I start doing my inspection, right? So I, and I was going around the left side, starting at the front door and going around the left side in most cases. And you're, you're looking up, right? So you start looking up at the gutters and the fascia, getting a photo and writing down, right? The fascia on the front's bat, and, you know, damaged. The gutters have dings in them. The, this downspout's got a dent. Go around the left side of the house and just kind of glanced down the side and it was, there was nothing there. It was just grass and a p- little patio and a sliding glass door on this, like maybe 20 feet from the corner where I was standing. And I'm looking up and I'm walking along. Didn't see anything on the siding or anything like that, but I'm looking up and I you know, kind of looked down to see where I was walking, walked across this patio. I got to the, the other side of it and I was like, that didn't quite feel like, <laughs> you know, you, you know what it feels like to walk across concrete. That felt like I was walking across a beach. I turned around and looked and sure enough, there were my big fat, you know, knucklehead footprints in fresh concrete. Oh. And I was like, oh, are you serious? And no flags. It wasn't, the, the right. forms were gone. It was just like, just sitting there curing or whatever. And I called my manager. And she laughed, and then she said, "You know, call the concrete guy, find out how much it, how much it is to be to, to fix it." And of course, he said, "You know, well, we God can't re- fix that, boy. We got to re- re- replace it. We got to tear out the whole, all that concrete and redo the whole thing." Da da da. da. So, and it's fifteen hundred bucks or whatever, it was a little patio. And she, and she said, "Put it in the estimate. Say, you know, and just write a line item saying damage during inspection. Put it in the estimate." But, I mean, just it's <laughs> dumb. Just not, pay- but but the, in my defense, it wasn't marked. I mean, it, it looked dry, yeah. and you would you, you would expect somebody to put stuff around it, like some upside down, you know, like paint buckets or Home Depot jugs or whatever with a, some tape or a little sign, or maybe tell me when I call, you know, oh, don't walk across that patio on the left side. We just had that port, but no, <clears throat> I actually damaged some gutters during an inspection yeah not whenever i fell off the roof that was, that was so, you weren't doing it the no, no i i actually you know didn't pay attention and and um put my ladder up there and scraped them up pretty good and um i knew i did it. i pointed out to the homeowner asking him what he wanted to do and he goes oh, i want to pay for and uh so i just called up my manager and told me the same thing so just put a line out in there and just pay for them and just put a line out a note in f9 yeah, you know, damage during inspection and move on. It ain't that much. Yeah. I'm like, am I gonna get charged back for it? And he goes, Yeah, you're good. You yeah, know, no. he says if it, it were, happens. He goes, if it's about five dollars more, you would have. Like, <laughs> <laughs> so I had this one. I actually had two, and um, we'll, we'll just kind of run them together. One of the things I, I've talked about that I love about this this career mm-hmm. is the people part of it, and meeting people and traveling the country and and just the experiences that you have that are very unique you know mm-hmm. that, and and you you quickly realize how small of a world it is you know we talked about how i was at a dog park you know and you know ran into a guy that i'd worked with a year before yeah you know just in the last two weeks or the last couple of months but i had one incident happen last week I'm looking at this house. It's a million plus dollar home up in the Northwest. And, you know, concrete tile, you know, there's a leak somewhere. We're going to try to, you know, looking at it. Contractors there go up the attic. There's mold, mold and rot everywhere, you know, which is every attic I looked at and, you know, Washington state had mold and rot in the attic. Um, 
you know, and just told him what I found, and he's he's nice about it. Okay, I'm good. You know, I understand. And uh, and they're in the process of trying to sell this house as well. And so now he's have to come in and pull everything off, redeck it, and everything else because everything's rotten out. But anyway, the story is is that I'm talking to this guy, and I'm like going, you know. I said, sir, where are you from? I said, that sounds like a North Texas accent. He says, I'm from Levon, Texas. Levon, Texas is eight miles from where I live. And uh, I said, really? I said, well, I live in, you know, I live in Wiley. And he says, yeah, you know, we chatted about that. He says, it's been about 25 years since I've been back. And my father passed away last time I went back. And I kind of figured out how old this guy was. I said, did you happen to know a guy named Joe? And I gave him his last name. And he's like, yeah, he goes, that was one of my best friends growing up. And uh, he says, is he still alive? Said, yeah, he goes, the last time I saw him was at my father's funeral. And I said, he's still kicking and working and in good shape and running his business. And you'd never know he's as old as he was. He goes, well, next time you see him, you tell him I said hello. And I pulled out my phone. I said, well, you tell him yourself. And I pulled out my cell phone and called up Joe. And he goes, Mr. Mathis, you're still alive. And where are you at these days? When are you coming back to Texas? And i told him where I was and I said I'm talking to one of your old friends and I said here you go and they started chatting with each other you know they talked to each other for about 10 minutes they're on my phone and on speaker and and those moments you know those those I mean what a small world you know that I yeah. I'm way out here you know on the west coast run into this guy he's friends with a man that I know matter of fact I used to work for the guy down there in Texas and they were they were best friends growing up but hadn't seen each other in years and on the flip side, you know, on another story, it's the same thing. I'm in, I'm in Albuquerque. I get a claim. You know, I see the name on it, Albert White. And uh, I'm like, man, that'd be funny. I went to, I played baseball and went to school in you know, grade school with a guy named Albert White. And uh, talked to the guy on the phone. I'm like, man, I bet you that's him, you know. I get to the house, I pull up. Some people know that I have a nickname. And as soon as I get out of the car, I walk around the back. Guy walks out of the garage. He goes, oh, my God, it's Bubba Mathis. I still recognize your face. <laughs> I still recognize yours, too. You know, and, and here's a guy that I haven't seen since I was 11 years old. That's Remembered his name, played baseball with him. We spent an entire summer together, you know, one time. And, and just hadn't seen this guy in forever. And I get a claim. You know, yeah. 700 miles away from home, you know, that's crazy. That's and, never and, this guy. And, and that is just the, I've had crazier stuff happen, but that's what I love about this. I love about this business, yeah. you know, is that you never know who you're going to meet, who you're going to run into, or you have a conversation with somebody that knows somebody that, you know, um, you know, I was up in, you know, Washington the last couple of weeks, there's two people I went to high school with that, that live up there that I've stayed in contact with, haven't seen them in years, got to, you know, spend some, you know, short amount of time with them. One person I didn't get to, but, uh, got to talk to them on the phone for a while. Yeah. And, and that's what I like about this business, man, is, yeah. is just the people part of it. Meet some really good people. There are people that I've done their claims and, and after the claim was closed and everything else, they've called me up on the phone and they've invited me to go to dinner with them and, you know, or just, Hey, we're going to be in Texas at this time, you know, like to get together, just stuff like that. And, and you're making friends everywhere. Now, if you're a unpersonal person, you know, and you don't care about that sort of thing. Well, that's, that's you, you know, and I'm a people person. I hate people, but at the same time, you know, there's yeah. a few people I can tolerate. Who was I you talking know? to? Maybe it was you, but somebody was telling me, I think it was somebody at a firm. They're like, you know, we've got uh, adjusters who've been doing this for 25, 35, 40 years, um, who are masters. They know everything, right? They, they will always turn in an exactly perfect file because they've been doing it so long, yeah. you know, but, we don't let them talk to customers because they're d or <laughs> jackasses or whatever. Um, so you can still have a career in claims, right. but you know, you have to understand that if you're like a customer facing person, you know, you're going to have to have some kind of a bedside manner because no matter how the claim turns out, if the homeowner, I say it a m million times, if the homeowner feels like you're giving him a fair shake, you will almost always yep. win. Right. And you're, you're there to help them if, yeah. they, if they, and people can feel it. And I try to, as much as possible, whenever I'm in front of, when I'm in front of the insured, I try to convey that 
I care about their claim. Yeah. That, that to the best of my abilities with the guidelines I have, I will advocate for them as best I can, you know? Um, but I do have guidelines I have to go by. Yeah. And if it, policy is what it is, right. Policy is what it is. And you know, I can't give you everything you want, but I'll give you everything I can, yeah. you know, whenever I can do it. And, and as long as I feel like they understand that if I leave, if I leave a, an inspection, leave an insured, and I don't feel like that they understood that before I left, you know, I will definitely try to, you know, reach back out to them, you know, yeah later and make sure that they understood everything and uh, that they're okay with the process. Okay. Uh, I'm not, I, I'm under no obligation to do that. It's just something that for me, I just want to make sure happens, you know, cause also it saves phone calls in the future, you know, it does, it does. Um, getting phone calls from a manager that says, Hey, this person says that you said this, or you know, you implied this. I know oh, that's not what I said. <laughs> <laughs> right. That's not, that didn't happen. Well, and you know, a, a one of the th- challenges that we have is on the, the the insurance side of things is that there's a lot of conventional wisdom out there about what we're trying to do mm-hmm. and everybody thinks you know, the two number one complaints are that we're trying to save money on their claim somehow and that we're trying to drag out the process two things i can you know never ever had any manager ever say hey let's get out there and save money on these claims let's get out there and pay it and c- get them closed right. I can't imagine dragging out the process. Having a stack of tree bill files on a desk would make me have night sweats. I, w- I would just, I'd just get up and like oh, just, yeah. just close them in the middle. Of, yeah. it, would, it would drive me crazy. I so, like that. you know, and, and, and then the homeowner on top of that, they've got a lot of times, especially in bigger markets, bigger cities, coastal areas, they have people telling them that stuff. You know, contractors, well, we're, gonna, we're here, we're going to represent you. We're, the insurance company is going to try and screw you, but we'll take care of you. They hear that all the time. PA. I really want to tell that story. Which story? About the guy who said that uh, he was tired of listening to. Uh... Oh. <laughs> but I'll put that on my channel. <laughs> yeah. It's a good story. So check into Claims Junkie on YouTube. Um, I'll get that put up sometime in the next get couple that of days. Put up. Yeah, that's For that's sure. uh, it's very R rated. Yeah. There's no way of cleaning that one up. Um, but you, but you have to you have to kind of swim against that that particular tide. You got it's you're going against the current because they're there and a lot of people will believe it no matter what you say. But the truth is not what they say it is, right? It just simply isn't. Yep. And to, and to your point, the policy is something that is. It's not the, the carriers don't make up the policies. The, right. It's it's made up through legislative action and, and state insurance boards and. Uh, case law that can change policies and things like that um, so it's not like the insurance company just made it up and right. you know maybe back in the early days sure but it's it, you know and there's things you pay for. it doesn't pay for everything it's not like right. remodeling insurance like what a lot of people think it is or like health insurance which people think is you know supposed to cover physicals and oil changes and yep. whatever it only covers damage caused by direct physical loss or whenever the tree falls on one side of the house and damages only three or four panels of a wood of a metal roof you know that's all i can pay for man if it can be repaired if the, if the customary and reasonable repair is a repair do that if it's you know some obsolete it's a two-year-old metal roof if it's asbestos or it's, yeah. you know who know, whatever it is if it's something that it, if the customary and reasonable repair is a replacement then you do that you don't like I, there's YouTube channels out there occasionally that show up in my feed and these guys, I'll, I'll watch a few minutes of their stuff and they, you know, your adjuster is trying to not pay da 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 da. And it's just not true. It's not true. It isn't true. We want to pay everything we can. Yeah. Remember earlier in the conversation we were saying we get paid more the more, the bigger yep. the claim is. That's true. So those two things are not compatible. They don't. It, when I don't sit there and go to every claim and, and tell, and tell the insured, how I get paid, you know, but occasionally during conversation, it, they will inquire, you know, well, who pays you, you know, you do. and, and well, you know, this is the process, you know, how do you get paid, you know, and I will let them know, I'll, I'll, let them, I'll just tell them, well, you know, this is how we get paid. And, you know, the, the bigger the claim, the, the yeah. better, the better pay we get on it. And so that's why I'm, 
doing a thorough inspection of your property and walking around looking at everything. That's why I'm getting in your attic. That's why I'm, you know, opening up closet doors. You know, yeah. I'm not because I'm being nosy to see what you own. You know, I uh, I want to pay you for everything that you have. Which brings me to one that I had. Whatever I told the guy that, he goes, in that case, come here a second. We go down the hallway. He opens up the cl- opens up the closet door. Okay, reaches inside. I hear a click. Okay, we go to another room. He pulls the bookcase back, and there's a hidden room. Nice. This water spot right here. <laughs> 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 he wasn't going to tell me, but well, since you've been honest with me, here. Right. You're going to write that up, you know? Yeah. Yep. <laughs> so, and that's something. You show the hidden room. Uh, the, I don't, it doesn't come out. It's, it's like my last possible resort. And it's yeah. usually when they got a, a contractor standing yeah. there blabbing some. Well, you know, they. they I know this insurance company after, uh, you know, the first 30 days there the adjusters are instructed not to pay claims i've, I've heard that more than once oh, believe yeah. it or not i mean it's just you're just dumbfounded because it's the dumbest possible thing anybody could say and i'm like listen i get paid you know more damage i find here the, the higher my 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 personal paycheck is on this so that doesn't make any sense i wouldn't do this job if they told me to do that period I said, you know, I'm not trying to pick on staff adjusters. I said, but I have more of an incentive to pay you yeah. than anybody, you know. I said, I'm not going to pay you what you don't have coming to you, but I'm going to find everything I can find, you know, and and get you paid for it. That's that's my job. As I was told from day one, you know, your job is to pay claims, not to deny claims. Yep. yep. That's your job. You get, you'll get more trouble for missing damage. Yep. And then, the, uh, of course, that also goes back to when you, when you have a have to make a decision make the decision that that benefits the, the policy holder yeah you know Ty don't, goes to the third. don't uh, don't think about it a long time just make a decision and go on because the roads are littered with squirrels that couldn't make a decision <laughs> i will always remember that guy nice. <laughs> nice. so you any jokes or are we so um did you hear about the two laundry clips that got married no i did not hear that yeah they met online that's a good one this is adjuster tv 